Hi, my name is Jeremy Miller. I am the president for the Special Force Association Chapter 500 here in Indianapolis. I am a prior 18 Echo, uh, was with 5th and 20th Special Forces Group, uh, served in Somalia and in Afghanistan. So today it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Mann. He is the man that invented our Wizzy Will, or Wiz Will, um, depending on how you want to say it. And he helped also develop our uh, tabletop space stations. And, um, you know, I, I got to meet him at a chance meeting at a cybersecurity conference at Black Hat and DEF CON out in Vegas over a cup of coffee. And I was so excited to, to meet Jeff and find out who actually invented this wheel that we used um, back in the day um, for our cryptology um, process in that. So without further ado, well, um, Jeff, can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know how you ended up in NSA and uh, what when you when you were there what'd you do? Sure, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I, I I grew up in a in a household uh, where my dad was a physicist and uh, he he got a job working for a naval, uh, actually the naval research laboratory uh, in D.C. back in the fifties and and. Um, you know, so moved to the D.C. area. This is before I was born, but I'm not that old. Uh, but he, he, he was working uh, on uh, the development of the first hydrogen bombs. Uh, and so I grew up in, I was born in D the D.C. area. The suburbs grew up in the area. My mom, you know, when I was a young kid, went back to work. And uh, she, she ended up working for the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, which was nearby. And... Uh, when I when I became of age, when I was in college, uh, she was able to get me a summer job working at uh, uh, Naval Ordnance Laboratory. Except for they changed the name to Naval Surface Warfare Center. Uh, actually, it was Naval Surface Weapon Center. I'm sorry, you guys are Army. I'm boring you with Navy talk. But uh, you asked how I got into how I got the NSA, and this is the story. Um, uh, so I got a summer job working at NSWC, and because my mom worked there, I, uh, it was a summer intern position, except for technically I wasn't allowed to be an intern because of nepotism rules, so they made me a, 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 an employee, and then when I went back to school for my senior year, I was put on leave, and um, I was able to come back like on you know, spring break and winter break and work some hours, which was kind of cool. And then when I graduated, while I was looking for my career position, which I'm still looking for, um, I went back to work for NSWC. Uh, while I was there, my mom, who worked in, uh, they called it personnel at the time, human resources, uh, she had a friend who, whose daughter had gotten a job working at National Security Agency. I grew up in Maryland, I'd, and which is where uh, you know, Fort Meade is and where National Security Agency is based. I'd never heard of National Security Agency because back in the day, it was a super secret uh, agency and nobody talked about working there. Nobody knew anything about it. And, and so I had never heard of it. Uh, but I filled out an application because uh, heard they were hiring and I you know, didn't have anything better to do. Um, what, what year was that, Jeff? <clears throat> this would have been 1985. Okay. Um, so I, I filled out the general, you know, uh, civilian government, uh, you know, job application and, and turned that in. And at some point I was contacted by them, invited to come spend a couple days with them to take what amounted to a, a series of aptitude type tests, skills tests. And, uh, interesting things and people ask me how did i get into cyber how did i become a hacker how did i get into this business and what it boils down to uh more than anything was i grew up in a household that was interested in and enjoyed uh, trivia enjoyed testing our knowledge of stuff that was a pastime that we would have around the dinner table and doing puzzles i i used to love to do puzzle books my, my brothers my dad uh, crossword puzzles, any type of puzzles. If you ever had seen a puzzle book, there's all sorts of different types of puzzles. And I used to like to do them. And when I was taking these aptitude tests uh, with NSA, um, there was a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, I remember one test, uh, uh, test was, uh, they would show you a, a picture of an object, you know, a 
two-dimensional depiction of a three-dimensional object. And they would say, what does this object look like from behind or from below or from above? And they would give you other pictures of choices. And, and you were supposed to pick, oh, well, this is what it looks like from the, the back or the side or whatever. Um, that was fun. I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Apparently not everybody can do that, but uh, apparently that's a skill. Uh, one of the other tests was uh, giving you a whole set of uh, what we, uh, communications traffic that had been intercepted and all encrypted. Uh, so you can't read any of it, but just based on uh, some of the, the headers, the preambles, the call signs, and the, the twos and the froms, you know, what can you discern from what's available? Uh, we call it traffic analysis. You know, could you figure out uh, the chain of command based on the volume of the traffic and who's talking to two and who's responding? It was it was actually you know fairly interesting to sort of map out the communications and you could sort of you know, start to see the command structure. Um, another another exercise was uh, giving you uh, an artificial language and and just trying to pick out. And, and try to figure out, not translate it, because it was a made-up language, but try to figure out parts of speech and what were the nouns and the verbs and the proper nouns and things like that. It was all sorts of stuff like that. I, I scored well, and I got a letter saying, hey, you've scored really well. We'd like to offer you an entry-level position. And I had nothing better to do, so I, and it sounded kind of cool to go work for this place that I'd never heard of, the National Security Agency, so I, I did it. Um, when I got there, uh, I was, uh, and I think this is similar to the military. You know, when, you're, when you when you first start, you're sort of everybody automatically gets secret level clearance. You know, if you can fill out your name and address, but they had to actually do a background investigation so I could get the top secret clearance, which takes months to, to perform. And so they they sort of put all of us new employees that were only secret level status. Uh, in a in an area that we it was basically the technical library and and we called it the blue La blue lagoon because in those days and this is probably ultra secret and I'll get in trouble for saying it but uh, operational security if you had secret level status your badge was blue had a blue border around it and if you had the top secret clearance which is what most people have your badge is green so we we're all blue badgers so we called it the blue lagoon. Uh, it turned out that uh, while NSA hired me and offered me employment, they didn't actually have a job for me. So part of the one of the things that I did while I was in the Blue Lagoon was basically go on a bunch of job interviews with different areas and departments at NSA so they could try to figure out an actual assignment. Um, because it's a quasi-military organization, we have similar... Uh, you know, descriptions of job codes and, and, and so forth, like the, like the Army has and like the, the military has. So um, one of my early interviews, and this is stuff I learned about NSA as, as I went to work for them, was uh, in the defensive side, uh, what at the time was called communication security and transformed to information security, InfoSec. Uh, it, InfoSec was maybe 10 or 15 percent of the agency, whereas most of NSA was the operations, the offensive side, intercepting communications, intercepting uh, whatever we could intercept and try to, you know, that, that, was, that was the bread and butter of what NSA did, does. And, um, and, and InfoSec was sort of a, a bastard stepchild that nobody understood, but, you know, it was an important mission because it was providing all the secure communications equipment and, and methods for all of armed forces, the military, uh, uh, you know, ambassadors and, and State Department and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I think it was my actual, probably my first interview was with a, a branch called the Manual Crypto Systems Branch. And they were responsible for all the paper uh, crypto systems. You know, machine crypto systems, this is before the age of computers and digital, um, but there were machine crypto systems and that was most of what InfoSec did was they would build little black boxes that would do encryption of, uh, you know, first analog signals or, and then later digital si signals, uh, secure telephones, secure radios, uh, which you guys 
more than likely were using. Uh, the stuff was at least originally designed and built, uh, at least designed by NSA, if not built by NSA. And certainly the keying material that, that went into those devices, that was produced by the InfoSec side of NSA. So um, primarily what was our product within this manual crypto systems branch was uh, one-time pads or any type of cipher systems, uh, call signs, uh, CEUIs, uh, operating instructions for the for for all the comsec equipment, all that kind of paper stuff that was produced, the instruction manuals, the keying materials, and, and whatnot was all produced out of this office. Manage, you know, we were we had a a, a comsec account. Uh, I ended up working there. Obviously, uh, they asked for. Uh, they wanted to have a, a, someone that was trained in cryptography to do a review of their systems uh, because they had been kind of neglected. With the advent of uh, the early days of technology and machine cryptography, um, they assume, somebody assumed, well, paper's just going to go away because we're going to replace all the one-time pads with uh, you know, radio, you know, secure radios and, and, mm -hmm. and, and secure mm -hmm. telephones and things like that. And I don't know if, if Special Forces was the number one uh, 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 objection to the rule, uh, but you guys carried a lot of paper back in the day, carried a lot of one-time pads. Your communications yes, officers, the commos, I was told, would carry like a 40-pound pack of paper, you know, dozens of one-time pads. And if memory serves, and maybe you could uh, – uh, correct me or, or set me straight. I, I know that we produced um, two color, two colors of one-time pads, the cover sheets, because one was for sending and one was for receiving. My recollection was they were blue and yellow. And I don't remember if, you know, which was which. I don't know if... if, if well, you know, honestly, I, I don't remember either. I mm -hmm. just know they gave us one and that's the one we used. So... Right. Base Station probably had theirs, and um, well, I, I know they had theirs. But mm -hmm. um, I, one thing that I, I would say is I don't recall carrying that much paper. Okay. So we, we could carry a pad, right? Uh, you know, good enough for the amount of time we'd be out on the mission. Right. But, uh, but we wouldn't need. Uh, well, I guess pad. maybe it, it depended on the mission. And, yeah. and, you know, one of the, one of, you know, fast forwarding to when I was working with special forces, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, this is all st stuff that I was being told by the guys I was working with, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So uh, this office wanted to do a review of their systems to see if they were still cryptographically secure. And so they wanted a crypt analyst to do that, a cryptologist. Mm -hmm. And they were having trouble attracting a cryptographer, a cryptologist from the operations side because InfoSec was the bastard stepchild. It, you know, that's, you know, the people that are doing cryptography are trying to break the codes and the ciphers of okay. at the time, primarily it was the, uh, you know, the Soviet Union. Uh, and all the, you know, all, all that that implies, the Cold War. Uh, nobody wanted to do this piddling, checking our own stuff. So they couldn't attract somebody. So they said, okay, well, let's just build one and train one. And that's the role that I ended up accepting was I went to work for this organization to learn cryptography, to learn how to be a cryptologist, cryptanalyst, and then proceed to do a, a review of the systems. Um, our systems to make sure that they were still cryptographically robust, uh, which is ironic because a one-time pad is uh, cryptographically unsolvable. The, the only way you could compromise a one-time pad is if you can steal the key. There is no mm -hmm. uh, brute force method to, to solve uh, 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 or to, to, to decrypt a message that's been encrypted with a one-time pad. So my first assignment uh, um, in this office, the manual crypto systems branch was with special forces. And the exercise was uh, to review what you guys were using as your emergency crypto system. If uh, for some reason you had to drop your paper, you know, you got mm -hmm. into, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not, I don't want to pretend to know all of your terminology, but you're getting into a firefight, a hot zone, and for some it's reason you're having, you're having to drop things and run, but yeah. still wanted to communicate this was a memory crypto system. And one had been designed for you guys probably in the 70s. And ironically, um, 
which is, but it's a key part of the story. The, the person that designed it in the 70s was a cryptologist that did actually come over from the operations side uh, on what we called a diversity tour. He had designed it and he had, he had volunteered to come back to this office for temporarily to, to start the review. He didn't want to work there permanently. Uh, and so he was there when I started and he ended up being my mentor. And he had designed the system in the 70s, did a review of it in the 80s, you know, when I came back and discovered a cryptographic vulnerability, discovered it could be solvable. So we decided we needed to replace it. So I started meeting with uh, the communications officers, the combos from, again, apologies for not remembering which group was which, but I, I remember going to Fort Bragg and there was a group of the combo officers combos together and uh, I was a business major in college so I didn't really know what I was doing and I had been through in my time at the Blue Lagoon a bunch of introduction to cryptography the history of cryptography and ciphers and codes and everything so I'd learned all these classic methods of you know how to encrypt things throughout the years mm -hmm. and I figured that's what we have to work with in order to produce a memory system um, but as I was working with special forces and learning uh, about what you guys did and learning that you, that you used one-time pads and learning that the, essentially the algorithm for how you used a one-time pad was, um, and I, I have a little cheat sheet here. This might look familiar to, to some people. Yeah, the trigraph. The, the first page uh, uh, or back page of your one-time pad had this table, which is called a visionaire or vignette table, if, you're, if you want to pronounce the French correctly, mm -hmm. which is the alphabet offset against itself, all 26 different offsets for the 26 letters of the alphabet, but A to Z and then Z to A. And, mm -hmm. and this was designed by a French mathematician back in like the 16th or 17th century as a method of, of doing uh, substitution, substitution cipher. So yeah, it, it's a trigraph, and it translated into these. Uh, I think it's 123 or something like that unique trigraphs, which I was told that you guys would memorize, and so you didn't. Well, well, well we certainly had people that did. I was not right. that smart, so uh, I needed my paper, or right. eventually what you did. So yeah. Well, and, and, you know, when I first started meeting with the commos and they said, yeah, we memorize it, but, you know, usually 80, 90 percent and, and the, even the organization of them, the ones at the top here are ones that are sort of spell out words or things that are easily mm -hmm. recognizable. Yeah. And it went down from to the really oddball random ones. And so, you know, I'm sure people were really good at the top. But, you know, when I started meeting with the commos, they were all pulling this thing out of their wallets that they'd, uh, you know, they covered in plat. They laminated. Laminated. Thank you. Yep. Um, they'd shrunk it down with a printer. They'd laminated. Everybody had this on yep. them. Yep. And so this was essentially the cryptographic algorithm that they were familiar with that was already in, you know, in their mind. And I thought, OK, whatever replacement system we're going to come up with, we should use that. So as we were going through, and I said as a business major, I decided, well, let's you know, let's involve the customer. Let's do a customer, uh, you know, small group type of thing. And and I came down with here's a bunch of different ideas, uh, different things that we could do based on classic uh, uh, ciphers. Um, and I'm not going to talk about what they are. Anybody can Google it because I don't want to say what we ended up with because I don't know that you still use it, but. I'm still NSA and I don't like to reveal secrets, even though they may or may not be secrets right now. But anyway, uh, in introducing a bunch of the different methods, we were trying to incorporate still using that algorithm, the, the trigraphs. And as I would be like going and, and writing on a whiteboard or a blackboard, showing all the different possibilities, I'm like constantly having to go to the, the chart and try to figure out what letters I should be using and uh, it was cumbersome, it was slow, and I was trying to, you know, work with the Special Forces a little bit better. Um, so one day I'm sitting in my office and I was like, you know, I'm struggling with trying to use this thing. I'm not going to memorize it. I'm not, I don't use it enough to memorize it. But I'd been through all these introduction to crypto courses and learned about 
cipher wheels. Uh, cipher wheels go back you know, hundreds of years. Uh, you can go online. The, the Confederates used them in the Civil War. The, the, and, and they essentially are the, going back all the way to Roman times, the Caesar, Caesar cipher, which is just a, a, a one for one substitution. That's what a lot of these wheels are. And I like, you know, which is two alphabets. All you're doing is offsetting if you've got the two alphabets on the wheel. And, you know, imagine the wheel that you remember and take out the little window. And so you just got the two alphabets. Mm -hmm. And but you guys were using essentially three alphabets. And I was like, but there's got to be a way to do this. And, and so, I, you know, sitting in my office one day and I talked to my mentor and you know, I want to give him credit because I said, there ought to be a way to do that. He's like, yeah, there should. And so we worked together and we figured out, yeah, you just write it this way and, and have an inner circle, but then we'll cover it up and cut the window. And, and so I made one out of, I, I drew it on graph paper. I used a compass to draw the circle and get, get all the pie wedges so I could line up the letters. And then I, I glued the graph paper to cardboard with rubber cement. Remember rubber cement? Yeah. Cut it out, got an acorn pin, stuck it together. So the first one was probably about you know six inches wide. And I just, I intended it for my personal use. And uh, the next time I went to, I want to say it was Fort Bragg I was going to mostly. Uh, the next time I was down meeting with the commo officers, I whipped this thing out and they're like, everybody's like, wow, what's that? What do you have there? Oh, that's really cool. And literally, I remember turning my back to write on the whiteboard to <laughs> whatever system we were working on, turned around, and the thing's gone. And all the guys that are there, they're just kind of... <laughs> I'm like, come on, guys. Give me back my wheel. And so eventually somebody <laughs> coughed it up. And and that, you know, at, at some point we got beyond the point of designing the system. We, we, we determined what we were going to do for the memory system. It was kind of a collaborative... And then I went out to the various uh, groups at the various locations to sort of train the commo officers and, and you know, everybody gets cross trained. So I was, I was doing sort of little small encounter groups with training on this new system. And I, I, you know, had my wheel with me, which would get stolen. So I'd have to make a new one. So they didn't always give it back. Um, and at some point I thought I, I asked, I don't even remember who it was, but I asked one of the people that I was, uh, you know, in charge of me working with special forces, would you guys have any interest in us making a bunch of these things for you? And they're like, yeah, that'd be great. So I set out to try to figure out how to make these things. And the InfoSec organization at NSA, at least in those days, uh, because they, they built everything uh, and they designed everything, they had model shops, they had metal shops, uh, you know, they would fabricate everything that they would end up building in production, but they would build them from scraps the first time. So I, I you know, developed some specs and um, at some point I could probably use um, some props here, but I developed the, the specifications, you know, we had to decide how big the, th the wheel should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and people said, well, you know, it should fit in our wallet or it should fit in our, you know, what's the the pocket on your thigh type of thing mm -hmm. and uh and somebody said well you know we, we were going to make it out of metal what kind of metal should we use uh and they're like well you know some of the times people are using this they might be undercover they might have to be going through and security wasn't anything like it is today at airports but there were still mm -hmm. metal detectors so we decided well we probably should have a kind of metal that's not going to be set off by a metal detector um so at any rate, uh, you know, we, we had uh, a prototype made up, and this is a, a, an unassembled prototype that I have that uh, I think these were actually aluminum uh, initially, and the, the letters were photo engraved, photo embossed, so that they wouldn't rub off. There was a little plastic uh, uh, washer uh, that went in between to help promote sliding it. And... Uh, Here's the other prototype that I have as assembled. So we came up with this little thing. Um, at one point, I went up to BWI Airport and, and I asked the security group, hey, I, you know, I'm from NSA. I'm working on a project. Could you let me walk through your metal detector? We're, we're kind of doing an experiment. So we te field tested it. And um, we ended up uh, having 15,000 of them made. 
uh, one of my frustrations uh, in, in this whole thing was uh, we found uh, we found a commercial group that would would make the actual dyes and do the embossing. And I had a, 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 a army master sergeant that worked with me in the office who was very passionate about helping people with special needs, uh, uh, you know, matriculate into society. So he was familiar with an organization that would hire uh, people with special needs to, to do certain manual tasks you know, like production, like assembly line work. Mm -hmm. So they, we hired them to actually assemble the pieces and, 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 and complete the wheels. Um, they were connected with like a little rivet and they could just, you know, press it in the machine, simple tasks that they could do repetitively. And um, all that to say is we ended up coming up with like a, a per unit cost to make these things of let, let's round it up to say 10 bucks. And, um, so we wanted to make 15,000 of them do the math. We needed $150,000. And NSA in those days built and, and supplied all the crypto to all the military. Um, my frustration was as much as I worked the system to find out all the different component parts within InfoSec of how to build these things and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, <laughs> NSA was very accustomed to working on multi-million dollar projects and I could, for the life of me, not find a way and figure out a way to only spend $150,000. You know, to my way of thinking, that was petty cash for NSA. There ought to have been some place that could just sign off on it. So my only, my only uh, uh, negative to this whole story is we ultimately had to go back to the Army and say, I'm sorry, we can't pay for these. We need, we need you guys to pay for it because I can't figure out <laughs> <laughs> how to pay for it. Nobody, nobody knew how to deal literally with that small a number in terms of procurement at NSA. I'm sure that somebody was out there. I never found. Them. So um, uh, the army ended up paying for them. We had 15,000 of them produced and distributed them. And uh, years go by. I moved on from that that office. I went on to work in other parts of NSA, and eventually I left NSA and went to work in the private sector. But over the years. Um, I would have occasion, uh, you know, maybe I'd go to a, an APSIA convention or, you know, trade show, something, something with military related. I'd have the occasion to run into somebody that was special forces. And I always would go up to them and say, Hey, have you ever heard of this little wheel thing? You know, do you ever, you know, do, do, have you, have you heard of it? Did you use it? It's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Like one time it was even still at NSA. They're having like a military appreciation day. And the guy had his, his, uh, you know, his rucksack or whatever there, and he whipped through it. It's like, yeah, here's mine. And over the years, I came to, to find out that you guys referred to it as the whiz wheel or the whizzy wheel. And, uh, you know, years would go by and I would run into somebody else and I'd ask them and, 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 and there, invariably people say, oh yeah, I think I remember that. I think I remember using that. Um, but for me, it was kind of almost like folklore. It's like, did it really happen? Because, you know, did they really use it? Because I know we made them, but, you know, mm. did they use them? And, and time and time again, it seemed like, yes, they did use them. And, you know, then it became trying to figure out how long did they use them? And I think that's still somewhat of an open-ended question. But So, so Jeff, on, on yep. that note, as, we, as we're doing this, and, um, and I and we'll place it on our website for the Special mm -hmm. Forces Association, um, maybe we'll get some of the audience, give a lot of feedback. Um, a lot of guys About. now, now understand who you are, where this came from. Maybe we'll get some of this information. So if you got some specific questions like that, I think we can get them answered. Well, that, that would be great. Um, I, I guess the specific question would be, you know, and again, not, not wanting to reveal trade, trade craft or trade secrets, but I, I assume that special forces these days are running around with encrypted radios, uh, encrypted you know, smartphones. They're talking over satellites and stuff. But the guys I was working with back then, they still had the radios and the antenna. And if they needed to, they would, they would transmit with Morse code. So they would, yeah. you know, have the little telephone. That was me. Yeah. Okay. And, um, well, and at some point we'll shift gears to the tabletop base stations because that's sort of the bookend to the to to this uh, this story of my involvement with special forces. But I guess my my big question is, uh, you know, 
how long did you use the memory system? Do you still use a memory system? Again, you know, if it's classified, we don't have to go there. But how long did the wheel, uh, you know, was it used in production? Because from my perspective, it was something that I designed for my own personal use that ended up being something that seemed to be of interest. So we made it, but then I kind of moved on to, to other things. And, you know, looking back now after an almost 40 year career to, you know, even meeting you, you know, two, a couple summers ago and talking about the wheel, it's just kind of ironic to me that one of the coolest things I seem to have done in my career was probably in like the first year or two of my career. And, and yet it's, you know, I worked with a bunch of people at NSA that were very involved in big, super long, multi-million dollar year, year projects. If you've ever worked in the government or the bureaucracy, you know, there's, there's a lot of, for me, there was a lot of frustration, like not being able to figure out how to pay for this damn thing. Hey, I'm, I've got something that they actually want. They can actually use. It's, it's yeah. real. It's tangible. We want to get, put it in their hands and nobody could figure out how to pay for it because they're all too busy working on these multi-million dollar, multi-year deals. Um, which again, we'll, we'll get to in a minute in terms of the, 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 your base station. And so to me, it's very satisfying in, a, in ways to think this silly little thing that I did actually had a positive impact on the mission of special forces and, and the security of our nation for some matter of time uh, where, you know, I didn't intend, I didn't go into it thinking, how can I build something that's going to you know, yeah, make a yeah. difference? It just kind of happened like that. So that's well, I, the biggest question is how long did, how long was it in use and did, and did people, you know, actually get use out of it, I guess. So, Which, so we, we, you know, this was a, a topic and I think I shared with you on one of our um, special forces uh, uh, chat rooms mm -hmm. and, um, and actually somebody had responded, said, yeah, those things are off the books, but we still had one and we still had them in our team room in 2010. Wow. Which, so. you know, I, maybe this was just hanging out, but I don't, you know. But uh, but that was kind of interesting, and it'll be real interesting for me as well to see the see the responses that we get um, from your talk on this. So, well, uh, I would assume that you guys, uh, active duty special forces, are not running around with one time pads anymore. Right, I, uh, I wasn't. But so. but the possibility that you still have a an emergency memory system that where you where you mm -hmm. still need to do some form of encryption, I, and, and that's the one that I don't want to talk about because I don't want to mm -hmm. reveal trade sure, crap. Sure. But, right, right. but I imagine that that's where the wheel, uh, where the longevity of the usefulness of the wheel came into play. Especially if you're not doing one time pads anymore, you don't need to memorize the trigraphs anymore. You're using it once in a blue moon or hopefully mm -hmm. never, but you still have to train on it. So I could see that that's where the wheel came about. Now, um, let me grab one more uh, artifact here, just so I have handy. Um, just in terms of a story, uh, I was approached, it was probably a couple months before I met you, you know, uh, BC before COVID when we were going to conferences. <laughs> right, right. I was I was at a uh, security conference in doesn't matter where it was. Uh, I want to say I was in Wisconsin. Doesn't matter. Uh, but I was in I was at the security conference and you know surprisingly or not I was hanging out at a cigar bar and uh, somebody that I knew from the community approached me and asked me if I. Had, you know, he knew I was ex-NSA. He knew I was a cryptologist, cryptanalyst from NSA. So I knew something about, you know, cryptography. He said, have you heard of this uh, Diana Special Forces cipher wheel? And I'm like, mm, what are you talking about? Uh, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with a whiz wheel, uh, but I've never heard it referred to as a Special Forces cipher wheel, Diana cipher wheel. So I Google it. And I, I quickly find an image of this thing. Um, and when I saw the image of it, um, I always carry this around with me in my backpack because people like to hear the story. I, I said to the guy, does that look like this? And he said, yes. I said, well, I invented it. He's like, no way. <laughs> so um, the, the person uh, that makes these things and it's and if you if you Google Diana Cipher Wheel Special Forces Cipher Wheel, this should pop up in your Google. You can buy them on Amazon. You can buy them on eBay. Um, 
to give credit, the, the name of the company is Creative Craft House. Um, but it, it's, it's printed on the back. Uh, interestingly enough, a one-time pad encryption system used by U.S. Army Special Forces Green Berets during the Vietnam era, which is funny. But uh, I found the guy who made these things, and I found an email after I talked to this guy, and I emailed the guy and said, hey, you know, I saw that you're making these wheels. I happen to be the guy that invented it. Uh, and, you know, would you like to chat? And I had an email the next morning. The guy's all excited. I said, "Yeah, you got the you got the story mostly right. Uh, the one-time pads have certainly been used, uh, you know, back to the Vietnam War era. I don't know when special forces first started using one-time pads, but the wheel itself, I can tell you definitively, uh, only was being used from the late '80s on to you know to whenever." Um, but you know, if if you if you've lost your copy or you didn't keep your copy. Uh, you know, not that anybody in the military ever keeps any of his uh, government issued uh, material. Uh, you know, you can you can go out and get a wooden wooden replica. This one's like four or five inches. They've got a larger version that's about six inches. You know, thirty forty bucks. You can get you can have it back again. Um, but um, so there's that. So that's the wheel. Now the other. Uh, major project that I worked on with special forces uh, while I was at this uh, manual crypto systems office in the late eighties um, was I was approached by uh, special forces. Again, they said, you know, we're, we're working on replacing our portable base station uh, with a, 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 what they were calling a tabletop base station that would be, uh, built primarily with laptops and computers mm -hmm. and um, you know uh, it's the other end of you guys in the field using the one-time pads and and this is where it gets funny especially hanging out with hackers in the security world people that don't know how you guys communicate with base stations they refer to your base stations as number stations and you can mm -hmm. go online today and find people uh that are intercepting the numbers and like, what is this? It's, you know, it's mysterious and magical and voodoo. And, you know, there's these mysterious number stations that are all bro all always broadcasting numbers. And what does it all mean? And it's, it's aliens. And there's all, you know, there's, there's a movie out, I think called number station, which is a goofy, they don't really know what's going on version, but um, what we were, what we were trying to, you know, before, and you're probably, you know, we're using the tabletop that that I was working on ultimately. But before that, the tabletop base station, and again, this is what the story I was told, um, was was it was portable. It was two 18-wheeler semi trucks. One was the power plant, essentially, and the other one had all the equipment in it. And the equipment consisted of, and I'll try to get this right, you know, uh, maybe I'll work backwards. Ultimately, they were broadcasting a signal that was an artificial language voice reading off the letters, letters and numbers, whatever they were reading, that were constantly going 24-7. And they, were, they did that by putting it on reel-to-reel -reel tape, and they would just play a tape recording of this voice. Um, so they had a tape recorder, they had the tra you know the transmitters and all the associated antennas and whatnot. To get to the point where they were doing that voice was they had uh, their version of the one-time pad was uh, a, a, a computer baud tape, the punch tape. So the very long tapes, if you ever you know see them in museums, with five or six or eight holes punched in them across the way. So they, that was the way they would get their one-time pad. It was a one-time tape. They would have to feed that into a machine that would read it, read what the letters were. They had a, another machine where you would type in what your message was going to be, and they had another machine that was going to you know, do the trigraph substitution to produce the cipher. The cipher then got... Uh, you know, it was recorded and, and, and printed, then it had to be fed into the machine that was going to produce the artificial language voice, and then they read the machines to record it. So that was all in a semi, uh, you know, a, 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 a full trailer, and, and there was two of them. And th those things were meant to be 
uh, portable too, but when they first fielded it, it took them so long to set up the antennas and get them set just right that they basically became permanent. And uh, I won't, you know, I knew at the time where the permanent portable base stations were that <laughs> trucks. Uh, you know, you know, there was one in there was multiple ones in multiple hemispheres of the world, of the globe. So, uh, you know, it was the '80s. Computers were becoming uh, uh, common, and so this uh, uh, contractor, SAIC, and a division of them, SAIC, SAIT Technology, had developed. Uh, sorry for the glare. I'm trying to get this. So there's no there glare. The tabletop base station that was going to be you know, 12 or 15, forget the number there, transit cases. That was everything that the two trucks used to haul. Mm-hmm. Pure, you know, could be completely portable, could be put into theater, didn't have to be, you know, not portable in particular hemispheres. And the guts of it was laptops, grid set computers, grid set laptops, ruggedized hardened you know these laptops could be dropped you know 10 20 feet onto concrete and they would still work type of thing military mm-hmm. military grade yeah, uh, there you go. equipment um the key to making this thing work though was they had to uh they wanted to replace the bog tape with putting the one-time pad key onto a floppy disk uh, which I had coincidentally had just done for another uh, customer, military organ, you know, military clandestine intelligence organization that had come with a, a similar request of, hey, we got a computer. Is there any way we could just do the encryption and decryption on the computer rather than take the hours it, it, it takes to painstakingly go through the the the, 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 the trigraph conversion hmm. and. I was able to produce a system like that. So uh, we had done it already. The precedent had been set. So the contractor came in and said, well, we're going to do it on floppy disks. We know that NSA can make it, but we need to do a security review of the whole system. So I ended up being the project manager uh, for this system. And um, uh, the long story short to that one was I I was working with a different set of groups at special forces, went to a couple different bases. Like they had the prototype set up at Fort Campbell. So I, I, I think my last visit to a special forces group was at Fort Campbell air assault. Um, they, uh, (laughs) and this is where I go back to my story about the bureaucracy and the frustration. When I, when I was in this manual crypto systems branch, uh, the the office right next door to mine was a, a, a you know a related branch. We were in the same division, but it was more engineers and guys that were trying to build and design new crypto. And uh, there's a guy that I knew that we had started relatively at the same time. We were in the Blue Lagoon together, or, or near you know pretty close. And uh, yeah, we we kept in touch. We we would talk every now and then and. At some point one day in a conversation, uh, he was telling me about the project that he was working on and he was working on, and I don't really have a, a good prop, but he was working on uh, a, a small device that would be a keypad with an LED screen above it that produced maybe t- you know 20 characters that had a, a thing you could plug in that would be a key and it was supposed to be an, you know, an encryption. Is that the D-Mag? I don't remember what the designator was, but and there was there was variations of it, but essentially it was designed to be digital. But it was it looked a lot like the old machine crypto systems. It was very clunky and bulky, but it was it was cool and digital. And um, in him telling me about what he was doing and telling me who his customer was, which was Special Forces, I'm like, dude, it sounds like you're doing exactly the same thing or you know trying to solve the same problem as the project that i've been working on for like the last year uh what's up and and we found out that in fact we were working to solve the same problem to replace the base station he was trying to do this kludgy little completely digital solution and and he was working with and i don't know all the you know i won't get this exactly but he was working with like one of the socoms but out of virginia uh, i'm sorry new jersey uh, was it fort monmouth uh at the time uh 
basically we were working for the same customer, but different offices that weren't talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was like, well, you know, we're pretty committed and this thing's pretty far along. And of course he was like, well, we're pretty committed and we're pretty <laughs> far along. And it was right around the time I was, I left that office to move on to a different assignment before this thing ever ended up being fielded. But I kept in touch with the guy that, um, that, uh, you know, took over the project for me. And, uh, he, he actually sent me a copy of a memo, which I might have in my possession, but I'm never going to say that I do because it might be classified. Uh, but I saw a memo at the time saying ultimately that the other guy's project was canceled. They were going to go with the base station. So I felt vindicated. Uh -huh. and my solution was what won. Because, I mean, each project was multi-million dollar, multi-year projects. There was a lot of money being spent on these two things. And I'm like, hmm. I don't care whose money is being spent. You're trying to solve the same problem. You ought to pick one. Yeah. Turns out that my 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 solution won. Yeah, that's awesome. I I feel I feel pretty uh, honored that you know that whole time area was when I was there, right? Uh -huh. So I got to experience this whole transition from the one time pads into the in the kick thirteen and uh, you know all that right. all right. that whole uh, transition with the base station, yep. and um, yeah, that's uh that's very interesting. That's uh, so. During your time there, do you remember any anybody specific that you worked with or, I mean, off the top of your head, or do you have any recollection? I mean, I know it was a long time ago, so. Yeah, um, the when I would go primarily to, to Fort Bragg, the, the guy that was kind of my handler, Master Sergeant uh, Mel Smith, uh, there was, uh, when I was there in the group of all the combos, there was a, uh, but he was he was kind of like you knew he was the cool granddaddy everybody respected him I think he was also a master sergeant um, his name was Leach I, I, I don't remember his first name I just remember he was, he was master sergeant Leach uh, I'm sorry it might have been chief Leach it's it was a long time ago he was a really cool guy um, a guy that I worked with uh, at, from Fort Devons um, uh, which I believe is closed now. Uh, his name was Vincent. Um, I, I had put this list together. You know, I, I found this flip file phone directory when I was cleaning my desk in the early days of COVID <laughs> in my desk. I had a desk blotter on it for the year, like 2007. That's how long it's been since I cleaned my desk. But I actually went through this and all the guys in special forces I have listed in here. So there was one guy I, I put together a list that I sent to you couple months ago to try to you know filter mm -hmm. through your alumni groups uh and plus i had the name so i was googling them one of the guys listed uh i think he passed away a year or two ago unfortunately uh which also makes me feel old but um i mean i don't know what the typical tour of duty for you guys is how long do you last on special forces before you get too old or you know, guys, manda mandatory that, retirement or anything like that <laughs> Uh, I assume the people that I was working with in the, the late eighties are probably no longer around. Sure. Yeah. But uh, as far as stories go, um, fun story for Fort Bragg. Um, you might be able to see behind me. Uh, I'm trying to figure out. You might see up on my bookshelf. There are some model tanks. I was in okay. the building. Uh, model tanks when I was a kid and so I love tanks you know a lot of people built model airplanes for whatever reason I like to build model tanks and in terms of uh, World War II technology uh, no offense but the Germans had everybody pee hands down maybe except for the Russians but they had the coolest tanks and you know I was a kid I thought these are really cool um, I, one of the times I was at Fort Bragg, I, I was driving around the base and I came across a, uh, a tank crew that was working on, um, I forget the designation, but it was the Sherman tank, M4, M5. It wasn't the, it wasn't the World War II one. It was whatever you guys were. It was the one that they could drop out of airplanes or off the back of the airplanes, whatever that tank was. But there was a crew there and I stopped and was talking to them. And they're like, oh, you like tanks? Would you like to get in one? So they let me climb into it and get in the driver's seat, which for me was really cool. And they were telling all sorts of stories about how they could outgun and outmaneuver 
you know, the big M1 Abrams tanks. They're like, no, we're, we're where it's at. You know, they're short, short barreled. I have to look up what the date. Is it ringing a bell for you? Because I have to look up what the tank is. I, I can't remember what the tank names were, to be honest with you. I'll have I mean, it. There's probably it. a lot of guys that are listening that would uh, spit that out real quick. I want to say it's the M5 or M551 Sheridan. Yeah, it's possible. Um, uh, they were saying that, you know, especially in, uh, in wooded areas, they could outmaneuver the Abrams because the Abrams had such a long turret mm. uh, you know barrel uh, whatever the gun they have mounted on it that they would you know they couldn't spin around if they were in the forest where these guys they the the gun wasn't even you know wasn't as long as the body of the tank itself so they were able to outmaneuver and win all their war games with them anyway so that was a fun that was for me personally it was fun to be able to sit inside of a tank because i never served in the military but I, I i enjoyed building model tanks when i was younger um I was introduced to sriracha sauce, uh, you know, going out to the, the local eats down at Fort Bragg. And, you know, I know that they've cleaned, cleaned up a lot of communities around military bases uh, these days, but back in the, in the eighties, there was still very much, you know, a reputation, even at Fort Meade, frankly, because I, I ended up living outside of Fort Meade, but uh, you get right outside the base and it becomes pretty seedy, uh, you know, communities very quickly. Uh, I mean, I, I near Fort Meade, I, I lived within a stone's throw of what was considered to be the local mafioso for Odenton, Maryland, which is mm -hmm. where Fort Meade was a, a budding. So, you know, I got to see a little bit of the seedy side of Fayetteville back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, going out to one of their favorite, uh, uh, Asian restaurants and having sriracha sauce on every table, you know, as a condiment. And I, you know, it's very popular these days. It wasn't back then. So that was, that was a, a fun little introduction. And then just getting to see, uh, you know, just, just getting to visit a lot of the military bases, uh, you know, Monmouth, Fort Devens, Fort Bragg, Fort Campbell. Uh, there was a reserve unit at the time, special forces uh, based at Fort Meade. Um, so that wasn't fun because that's where I worked. Uh, but my, <laughs> other, my other fun visit was to the, and I don't know if they're still there or whether it's still open, but May, Mayport Air, Air, Air Station. I uh, don't know. Down in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, there, there was a detachment there, a group there. And the one time that I visited there, um, I want to say it was the, the Iowa, the battleship Iowa, Iowa was in port. And we had a day, you know, day's worth of meetings and they said, well, you know, we ought to, you guys ought to finish early and try to go out and get a tour of the, of the ship because they let people on it when they're in port. And so we were trying to rush to, to, to get out there. And, and by the time we got out there, they had already pushed out. But um, I know this is not an army thing. This is a Navy thing, but it's still pretty freaking impressive when you see a battleship. And they've got all the crew lining, you know, when they, they leave port, it's a Navy tradition. They line, they're all in their whites and they're all lining the, the edge of the ship and, and watching that thing be pushed out into the middle of the harbor and then getting underway under its own speed. And as large as that ship was, it got up to speed really fast. It was pretty impressive. That that was impressive because you know I got my start working for the Navy, so I was a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I lean a little bit towards the Navy. I apologize to the Army guys. I worked more so, with the Army though. <laughs> so so the span of years that you were actually with the SF teams and uh, and mm -hmm. groups, what 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 year to what year um, were you doing that? Um, I, I started in that I started in NSA in the fall of '86. I was in that crypto office by the beginning of you know end of '86, beginning of '87, and I left that office in early '90. So '87 through 1990 is when I was okay. um, working with special forces groups. Okay, yeah, well, great. Yeah. Well, Jeff, I, I I'm I'm honored to have you on here and hear the story uh, behind these these items that we used a lot and um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure uh, the other guys that are going to hear this and, uh, and read about it are, are going to be glad to have met you as well. So I appreciate your time and, and thank you so much for, uh, for sharing the story with us. Really, really do appreciate it. No, oh, thanks for listening. And uh, uh, it's just fun to be able to kind of put a bow on this thing after all these years and, and, and 
find out what really happened to this silly little thing that I did for myself that ended up being, you know, something that was meaningful. Oh, I should say one more thing, uh, just for the record, two more things for the record. Um, three more things for the record. Um, <laughs> I was perplexed when somebody introduced me to the, the wooden wheel and why it was being called the Diana crypto system. Uh, and I finally remembered, well, I knew that, you know, the, the code names for all the crypto systems that NSA produced were always code named with some sort of Greek, Greek Roman myth, mythological character. Everything's got an official designation, you know, just like every piece of material in, in, in the armed forces. Uh, and I finally remembered that it was the one-time pads themselves that were called Dianas. Uh, mm. So it was the Diana one-time pad. The wheel itself that we produced, uh, we had to look up the designation, and we ended up coming up with HAL, I'm sorry, Hotel Alpha Lima 001. So that's the official designation of this. And it was called the HAL 1 uh, Visionaire Wheel. Um so nobody ever knows it is that, but if, if yeah. I actually submitted a FOIA request, you know, BC that I've never heard from NSA to see if they could find any written information about the uh, this wheel, because you know, one thing we didn't mention, we're, I'm trying to, you know, I've got these prototypes. I'm going to grow old and die someday, and I would love to see the history preserved. So I'm trying to get at least these prototypes uh, back into. Initially, I was trying to get it into the NSA Cryptologic Museum, and then you you meant, you you tipped me off to the fact that there's a Special Forces Museum that we're trying to get this wheel and the story into. Um, if anybody has an actual production copy of the wheel that they'd be willing to part with, I'd love ultimately for the the actual production uh, model to end up in one or one or both of the museums. I've got the two prototypes. I'm happy to give one to each of the museums because you know I'm not going to be around forever. Um, and, uh, the main reason I wanted to do the FOIA request was, uh, when I, when I produced the wheel, when it went into production, I was written up for a cash award, you know, merit thing. That was a thing that NSA did, you know, you know, something to a little bit, if you go above and beyond, they want to recognize you. And my boss, he had to write up a, 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 a little abstract, a little description of why I should you know, get a, get a cash award, be recognized. And he entitled that, uh, man reinvents wheel. <laughs> and I, I would love to just you know, get a copy of that just for, you know, again, for the historical perspective. <laughs> and, you know, my last name is man. So it, you know, it's, that it's is a, funny. It's a play on words. there. Those are the, the last little, uh, anecdotes about the wheel that I wanted to make sure we mentioned. Yeah, well, we're sure we're sure uh, we'll try to get you in the museum. I, I present everything I can over there, so you can you can do that. The museum, uh, as you know, is taken down at Bragg, and actually, the Special Forces Association is mm -hmm. now going to be taking that over. So once that uh, once that happens, I, I hope to represent uh, you to get. I actually in. went and visited it, the the Special Forces Museum at Fort Bragg back last well. Again, BC. So it would have been fall of 2019. I was in, uh, I was in the Raleigh Durham area for a, a security conference and uh, drove over to to see the museum. Mm -hmm. So, and then shortly after that is when they kind of shut it down, and of course the whole COVID thing. So I, I it, it's a very impressive building. They've got a lot of infrastructure there. So I hope somebody can pick it up and reopen it. I did run around trying to look for any. Uh, any place where the wheel might be or where it might fit and of course they have uh, 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 you know uh, dioramas depictions of you know people you know mannequins driving in jeeps and there's right. a lot of a lot of the radios that i recognized uh all the crypto stuff was not there it was just the radio uh but you know certainly maybe a little bit of a special display or something like that because you tell me, you guys that used it, tell me that it was meaningful. Like you said, one of the guys on your, your Facebook group said that there should be a holiday, a national holiday. Yeah, 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 he yeah. did. <laughs> so I, I'm glad that it was useful. I'm glad I'm glad that it helped the mission. It was certainly not what I intended initially, but I'm, I'm glad somebody got some good out of it. Yeah. Well, good. Well, well, thanks again, Jeff. And we will, uh, we will be talking soon. And, um, 
I'll let you know when this is posted.